I'm Keith Cambron. This is the course How the Internet Works. This is Hour 3, Section 1, TCP and HTTP. Let's begin with a comparison of IP, which we've talked about in several previous sessions, and TCP. IP, we said, was connectionless. That is, the packets are sent on an individual basis, and one packet has no knowledge of any of the predecessor or successor packets. TCP is connection-oriented, meaning there's a specific starting point, uh, usually a client, and a specific endpoint, usually a server. So there are two ends to this connection-oriented uh, path. IP is best effort. Uh, there's no acknowledgement, there's no error checking within the service data unit, although there is of the header, and packets can be lost, they can be impaired, or they can arrive out of sequence. That's just the opposite of TCP, which has reliable delivery, so any information that is uh, received is passed on to the upper layers, guaranteed to be error-free and in the right sequence for delivery. And the information is complete, presuming the entire session uh, was a success. IPs hop by hop routing. The routers make individual s decisions. And IP datagrams can be routed in different ways, depending on the state of the next, uh, network during the course of the session. TCP, on the other hand, appears to be uh, that connection-oriented end-to-end routing uh, whereby everything is routed in only one way in the sense that there's one starting point and one ending point. IP is a packet protocol. TCP is described as a stream I.O. protocol. TCP evolved at a time when Unix was uh, emerging and was very uh, successful in popular programming paradigm and the idea of unified I.O. and stream I.O. was very popular and TCP adopted it. What that means is an application or a program can write to TCP socket, which we'll describe shortly, in the same way it could write to a file on a local disk. So from the viewpoint of application software, uh, writing across a network to a process at the other end of the network is identical to writing to a file on a local drive. And uh, so it is a stream rather than a packet is the mechanism for a transmission in TCP. Here is a, a simple diagram of a TCP end-to-end -end connection. The um, client, which in, could be a web browser, for example, sets up a connection with a distant web server over TCP connection that has two sockets, a socket at the originating end and a socket at the terminating end. The term socket is used both in protocols to mean a logical facility, but in, in software it's also a system call in most programming language languages have the uh, socket API for making just these kinds of connections. And a connection is identified by the originating IP address in the originating port and the terminating IP address in the terminating port. In this case, again, I've used port 80, which is the well-known port for HTTP or web services. With um, a socket-oriented TCP connection, it operates by having the server act as an active listener. So a process starts on the serving end that attaches itself to port 80 of the host machine or the interface uh, with the specific IP address. Uh, that socket is in a ready-to-receive state and a client wishing to set up a connection instantiates a socket on the client side and the host will assign the uh, receive port number and then an IP datagram is launched that has encapsulated a TCP segment which I'll show you in the next slide 
and attempts to open the connection at port 80 in the server. If the server accepts the connection, then the two sockets are interconnected. And at that point, the client, the web browser, can start writing, just as it would write to a file, to that client-side socket. The information will be segmented and sent across the socket to the far end. Once the connection is established, it is a full duplex connection, meaning the client sends data toward the server, and the server, in turn, responds to the client. The responses include acknowledgments and information about the window size, which I'll describe shortly. So this full duplex connection means there are IP datagrams that have TCP segments that originate from our client side, IP address 77 with port 23546, and they contain not only data but acknowledgement information. And in a similar fashion, datagrams and TCP segments originate at the server with acknowledgements and also with data from the server. So it is a two-way connection. At this point, I want to break away and show you what the TCP segment looks like and we'll talk a bit about how it's constructed. Recall that a protocol has three essential elements, a message PDU which acts much like an API in a software program. It's a way of passing parameters or information from one process to another. The second element are procedures. Those are methods that are performed within the protocol on both the transmit and the receive side. The third element is state information, that is information or data that is maintained by the receive and transmit sides uh, that capture the state of the protocol at, at any point in time so the proper procedures can be applied. The message PDU we see here is really a TCP segment. In TCP, they're called segments, uh, not uh, message PDUs. And these segments are formed by TCP when a higher layer protocol passes a data stream to TCP. A TCP, in turn, formulates a service data unit, which is passed to the IP layer and encapsulated as shown in the diagram. So we would see HTTP passing a stream. The stream is broken into segments and header is attached by TCP. And then that service data unit is encapsulated in an IP datagram with its own header. And subsequently, that is wrapped by a, an Ethernet frame, in this case, a link layer frame would be used to transmit then again across a physical layer. When TCP segments the stream from HTTP, it does it in a way that the final IP PDU fits within the boundaries of the uh, Layer 2 Ethernet frame. Uh, that's important because it prevents or at least inhibits fragmentation of the IP PDU. It's not always possible to know uh, the MTU sizes further downstream, but at least on the local interface, if the TCP implementation is done correctly, it'll be segmented in a way that will prevent fragmentation, at least at the host. Within the TCP uh, header, we find a source port and a destination port. Recall that the IP layer has the IP addresses and the port information is contained at the TCP layer. In the case of UDP, the user data part, then comparable port information for UDP would be in that protocol message as well. A sequence number is included in the header and that's the sequence of this segment. An acknowledgement number, which is a way of acknowledging by the receiver of the segments that have been successfully received. A header length is included, which is the length of this header. Again, the TCP segment is organized in much the same way as an IP 
PDU and then it has a header and a data segment. There are reserve bits and there is a code and I'll talk about the code in, in, in a bit. Then there is a window advertisement or a window size that is included in, particularly for a receiver to indicate recommended buffer size and we'll go through that in some detail. There's a checksum and the checksum applies to the entire segment and an urgent pointer and again the talk about the urgent pointer when we get into discussing the code. And there's padding. It pads out the options field. There's a, a number of options. We won't get into the options here just to say that various options get, can be applied uh, within a, a TCP segment. And then the service data unit which is really a segmentation of the information coming uh, from the upper layer such as HTTP. Of course other protocols besides HTTP use TCP. FTP is one example protocol that uses TCP but we'll focus here on uh, HTTP. So let me say a few words about the code word that is a 6-bit field and I sh should have pointed out that these are octets again so this again is a 32-bit field that we're looking at made of four octets code word has six uh, bits within it there's an urgent pointer field and the to say that the urgent pointer is valid and the urgent pointer is used for what is called out-of-band data so uh, normally, the TCP segment is designed to carry the stream from above with the user data in it, but occasionally a urgent signal needs to be sent that is out of band, that is apart from the data stream. An example would be if you have a remote session uh, ongoing and the receiver is hung or ignoring you, you might want to send a break or a control C or uh, to interrupt the process at the far end. Uh, that would be a case where it would be appropriate to set the urgent bit in the code field and then you would point to the segment in the service data unit that contains the urgent information such as control C or break information. There's an acknowledgement field that would indicate that this is a valid acknowledgement and then there's a reset connection bit if you want to reset the uh, TCP connection and then there are bits uh, synchronization and finish that have to do with opening and closing TCP connections. Now to understand transmission and windowing we'll go back to the previous slide and look at the uh, transmission process and how segments are sent across the physical interface and how they're acknowledged. We'll begin by uh, looking at a windowing and we will assume a window size of four. The stream is broken into segments by the client in this case since we're going to be transmitting the server and I've shown here that segments 12 through 15 have been transmitted to the web server. The web server acknowledges that transmission with a window size of 4 by sending back IP datagram that contains a TCP segment with the acknowledgement bit set and a value of 16. The value of 16 means that the next segment the receiver or server expects is one with a segment identification a sequence number of 16. At the same time it can advertise a window size to the transmitter. In this case I've chosen 4. That means if I have send an acknowledgement of 16 that means I've received 15 and so the transmitter, the client, would be free to transmit 17, 18, and 19 but would need to stop there because the window would be full with 4 segments until I send an acknowledgement of one of those four segments. I'm not bound to acknowledge 17 next. I could acknowledge by sending a value of 20 which meant that I had received 19. If a 
segment is lost, then that segment would be in the acknowledgement field of a subsequent transmission from the server. Windowing solves a lot of different problems and is a very elegant solution because it provides a, not only a way to guarantee sequencing uh, because the client in this case will retransmit until a segment is acknowledged, but it also provides flow control. Flow control is an important function in communication systems because the sender can overwhelm the receiver and the receiver needs to moderate the sender in some way with a feedback mechanism. The window mechanism provides a, just such a function uh, while it also provides for retransmission at the same time. So there's a lot to windowing and the windowing sizes are dynamic. They can be expanded or contracted as a function of the quality and bandwidth of the connection. That's a bit beyond this course, but it is certainly a topic for further reading. And uh, speaking of further reading, I'm providing another suggested list uh, at the end of this session.